record actually. We are now recording. Okay. Can people see my screen? Yeah. Yes. You can. Okay. So I'm going to go back over this slide. And between yesterday and today, I added some diagrams to explain these because I would like some opinions on this one here. Um, and there was a uh, part two of this slide. And so there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six slides. The original two, and then four diagrams that just expand on uh, two, three, and four in case you didn't understand those. And so I'll kind of walk through this one. So this is issue 43. Um, that originally was filed by Hannes, and he's not here yet, but at least the rest of us can talk about the different options. I think uh, uh, Hannes raised the question, had a couple of options, and I'd like to discuss them. And so uh, I'm going to uh, go back over these, but I'm going to do so one slide at a time and uh, explain what I go through in a particular example. So let me go into full screen here. So you don't have to squint. Um, all right, all right. So here's the example, okay? And then I'll walk through a slide on option one, two, three, and four. So um, the example, ca the, the example case that we're going to walk through is where you have an untrusted app that has a dependency on a uh, trusted app A. Okay, that trusted app A comes from TAM A, and say in the untrusted apps manifest that has the TA A's identifier and the TAM A's URI. Okay, now internally. That is expressed in a suit manifest, and that suit manifest depends on a different trusted component, meaning a different suit manifest. That different suit manifest, and this example is hosted by TAM B. Okay, this might be, for example, because TAM B is the TA developer, and the trusted component B might have, say, a personalization data that contains a private key necessary to decrypt A. That would be an example. Okay, and so that's why. Uh, in the architecture document and previous discussions, we've said these two things can be from two different TAMs. And so here, uh, the suit manifest for A depends on the suit manifest for B. Okay, so that's the example that we're gonna walk through four different potential approaches that we could take, although one and two are very similar. Okay, so option one works as follows, right? The agent sends out a query request, and just as a reminder, the query request happens by the agent opening up an HTTP connection to TAM A that has uh, empty content, and so the first message comes in that HTTP response. That's query request. The agent says, hey, I need A. Okay. So in this example, either here or maybe a priori, TAM A would have to reach out to TAM B and go and fetch or download the content that's the, the bundle with the uh, suit manifest for, uh, for bundle B. Okay. And so what protocol is this? That's why it's a dashed line here. It's not necessarily the T protocol. Maybe it's HTTPS or something. But um, the question is, well, what if TAM B only wants to release that to an authorized entity that it tests? And so that's a whole bunch of extra work that would be necessary there. Uh, and so that one's very complicated. It might be doable, but it's very complicated Okay, to, to try to figure out what this fetch B thing is. But if in theory you could get B, then what happens is A would send install with both suit manifests in there and, and the agent installs them both and sends back a success in the success case. So here the difficulty is what is this fetch B thing, especially when B needs the uh, courier to attest. And in this case, part of the point is TAM A is not trusted by either for, for the content of B. And so how do we solve that? Um, complicated, but potentially doable if you want to do a bunch of work. Okay, so that's option one. Option two is very similar. The only difference in option two is that the install oh. messages are on two different messages, right? And so you install each dependency, success, and then finally you install the dependent A. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Okay. Option number three works like this. Okay, here, so remember here, the dependency resolution one and two is done by the TAM A. Now, it has to fetch all the dependencies so it can push all the installs down. So the agent is only talking to the, the top level TAM, meaning the one that actually de that the UA actually depends on. Okay. Unlike uh, those, option three puts the dependency resolution inside the agent. Okay. So my understanding is the suit manifest actually allows this, and that's why this one is my uh, preferred uh, out of the four. This is the one I like the best. Okay. And this one works as follows, right? Career request, hey, I need A. That part's the same. TAM A just says, okay, here's A. Here's some dangling dependencies. It depends on B, and here's the URI for B, and so that's expressed in the suit manifest. But it has this dependency on this thing that has to be resolved, okay? And so at this point, um, the agent can't complete that install, right, because it needs the dependencies before it can install A. 
but it has the TAM B's URI because it was in that suit manifest. Okay. And so it has to reach out to TAM B that says, hey, I need to resolve a dependency. TAM B sends a query request saying, please attest to me. Query response says, hey, I need B. Here's my evidence. B says, great, you're authorized. You can install B. Okay, great, successful. And at this point, the suit manifest processor is done with that particular dependency and then can continue, finish installing A and send back success A. Okay. Well, so in this example, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, so how does the agent know that it needs to go to TAM B? So in your messaging here? Yeah, in the suit manifest for A, the yes. suit manifest for A identifies each dependency, just like oh, the UA's okay. manifest identified the dependency for A, and it included the TAM A's URI. The all the information necessary to resolve that dependency would be inside A's suit manifest that comes back in this install. Okay, and the manifest is sent a query request response. The yes. manifest is sent inside the install message. Right. Okay. Okay. So this install A has the suit manifest for A, which includes, you know, the binary if it's bundled with the with the manifest. It includes the metadata for A, which includes all the, the list of dependencies, if any, which in this case would include the information necessary to resolve B. Okay. So here the disadvantage of A is just that there can be a significant delay between the install and the success of to, that's in response to that install. Okay. So in some sense, if A is, if the TAM is trying to keep state, then he sends this install and potentially never hears back for a while, right? What if this was a, took a long time to download or this took a long time to reach or whatever? There could be a significant delay in between here, okay? Again, this is still my favorite option out of these, but that is the disadvantage is you have to deal with this fact that I send an install and don't get back a success until everything is all done. And meaning until uh, the agent is kind of done and knows whether it succeeded or failed. And so there could be a significant delay. So that's the disadvantage here. Is that actually a disadvantage? This is, uh, my, was that Brendan? It was that actual disadvantage though, because my it's opinion? not done. No. It's not done. How, um, how does his opinion? Yes, my opinion, no. Yeah. So so the disadvantage comes to the, the timeout and and the amount of caching potential that the TAM, so it gets to, to the question of the scalability. Yeah. Yeah. versus latency performance yeah, yeah. when so, i get to when i get to the part two slide you'll see there's another wrinkle that doesn't show up in this particular example uh so put that put the, put that question in the back of your head because we'll come back to it but my opinion is no it's not a problem so all right Hank, so so dave i suck yeah. at note taking <laughs> so i was trying to capture the options and i didn't quite catch the differences between options sure. one and two Okay, the short version, the one sentence version is on this slide, which is a slide seven in the proceedings. Oh, so maybe I don't need to take notes on them. Uh, option one, was, the only difference was one install message and option two was separate install messages. And I only split uh, those because they came up in the notes on issue number three, uh, on issue 43. Uh, uh, if, if they weren't so, separated in the issue in comments, I would have combined those into one option. Oh, can you show me those again? Okay. okay. This is also one, one, two, yeah. one, but again, two. Yep. Okay. No, no significant difference as far as the, the main issue goes. Well, the, uh, um, when you have the three and a four, when you have three next to page, where you have four. In yeah, I haven't finished fashion, with four right? yet. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> four. Okay. So gets to what was Hannes's proposal, okay? Or, uh, something closer to Hannes's proposal here right? with that delay. I want to say you can see this install kind of has a hanging no response until the end, right? So Hannes proposed, what if you had something else that came back here that indicated, you know, continue or in progress? He described it for a different case than the one that I'm walking through, but in the example that I'm walking through, then you might say, you know, I'm working on it. So it's not a success, it's not an error. We have to define a brand new message for this that says, okay, working on it, just to let you know. Uh, and then at the end, you'd have to send back a success, send back the success, either unsolicited, by unsolicited, I mean when you first open the HTTP connection instead of a zero byte post that gets a query request, it could be a post that just has the success in it. And in that case, it's unsolicited. And this gets into that question with um, the discussion we were having about token yesterday. 
because the install echoes back the token in, in here, the in progress. And so what token to use here? Do you reuse the token or what? So that's some of the complexity there. Or do you generate a new message here? Is this another query response? Do you generate a success to you? And so that's the complexity reason that I don't like option number four, because I don't think the delay is a problem and trying to define this other message or what you do about those to me is unnecessary complexity. Okay, I'm gonna flip back and forth so people see the difference between three and four again. Okay, any uh, clarifying questions between those two options? So, uh, let's go to option three, right? Let's say, imagine, uh, extreme <clears throat> Uh, application A depends on not person data, depends on 10 or 100 other TAs. Yep. Then this process takes long, right? Do we need to handle that case? It almost put this uh, A and dependency, so you finish dependency, yep. it takes uh, 15 minutes to finish, right? Then yep. you install A to success A will not work. That delay well, depends. The, the same thing, thing that, uh, can uh, happen. The same thing then mm -hmm. can happen if you have zero dependencies. If you just have a really complicated install that just takes 15 minutes because you're on a constrained device and you got to do a bunch of operations that depend on maybe resources being available that might take a while to be available and so on. Um, you mm -hmm. might need this. You might take 15 minutes even with no dependencies. So now let's just separate our son. Is a do we treat as a, uh, let's use HTTP as a practical example right here. So we do a, it's a, even install A and success A, that's a two HTTP transactions. They're not the same transaction. We talk about here mobilization token expiration, right? Not the individual HTTP transaction, right? Because we say, say queries, but install A is a, it's a, uh, it's um, interesting. It's a, it's actually requested. It's always initiated from the agent, right? Agent reach out time A. Yeah. So time for A, everybody else. Cast. For anybody else that's new, each message going to the right is an HTTP post, and each message going to the left is an HTTP response to a post. So there's an invisible post that's right before this query request, so that's the response, and the next HTTP goes from here, and this is the HTTP response. Um, and then there's an invisible empty post here with a message that comes back, and then there's a post here with a response that comes back in the install, a post in the success with a, you know, okay, and then another post with a success with an empty response. And so that's how the HTTP, has HTTP messages work. Right, because these are two um, independent, or well, two separate uh, HTTP transactions. And option so there's no, right, so there work. is no hanging HTTP. We, right, we, we need to ensure the token, whatever that session, we'll have session transaction ID, let's like say that way. Install a, well, ex expect a token and then transaction ID back, say it's just that transaction mm -hmm. done. As long as that have a, a longer uh, expiration time window, this can work. It doesn't need to acknowledge it. It doesn't have heartbeat of acknowledgement. Say I'm working on, I'm working on, right? Option four is about, right. about heartbeat of acknowledgement. I'm live, I'm working on. So I think that, um, I tend to not go there. I, I also favor option three over option four myself. I don't want to change the protocol here dramatically to add that uh, heartbeat right. acknowledgement. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm going to go back just to respond to you to the slide that we ta had uh, that we covered yesterday, which is this one, which is um, uh, be pending the discussion that we will have in suit uh, at the suit working group. Um, that it is possible that we may not actually need a token for install and delete. And so there may be no need to keep state on the TAM with a token. And so that depends on what the resolution is uh, for suit, so. So, token, we need to identify. I actually want a little bit of logic here to transaction ID or uh, token. It's uh, a, okay. We want to be stateless, like that. Stateless means for each transaction, right? But that data is in the payload itself. When we say install uh, TA1A, right, application A, this one identify this one, that transaction request, okay, say. The, the identifier is the identifier of which suit manifest you were installing. That's right here and, and uh, the response. And it, it, this is basically copied out of the uh, install or delete, well, the install in this example. But it's a, it's a not request ID, is it, right? It's, a, it's what to install, not to say, we yeah, yeah. 
which transaction. Right. And so why do I care which transaction it was? I claim that I don't. What if I say, well, what if that <laughs> one I have somewhere have a good time, it had two commands to install. Somehow in other orders, spam, whatever, so the request is sent to install command. You need to identify which one's responded. Yeah. You're never going to have two installs for the same suit manifest, or if you do, then the second one is a no-op, right? And so the suit digest identifies whether you're installing A or B. Mm, you don't need a token to match. That's, that's, the suit digest says, you sent me an install with a suit digest. That's the token. Uh, Brendan, please, collect, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is my understanding. So. Correction needed. What was that? That's many phases. Of, my concept was, uh, sorry, uh, Brandy, go ahead. I, I said oh. no correction needed. No, the, hey, the point here is that the um, the suit manifest has a digest. The digest is collision resistant. If it, you have a collision re resistant digest, you have a unique identifier or a, you know, statistically probably unique identifier. And that should be good enough for virtually any purpose. Yeah, I thought it was a suit. Uh, I guess, uh, I guess, um, the manifest file is uh, a described dependent described with the application itself. It doesn't depend on which transaction, right? Uh, that it's unique in that way, but it's uh, not unique based on like in the morning I send a, send a install command versus after we send install command. Those two commands should be different. It has its own unique identifier to me. Those are different transactions. Right? But I would all that. Sure. So, 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 so right? they're different transactions, yes, but they have the same result. And what you care about in suit is results. So if you send the same command a second time mm -hmm. and you have a dangling uh, reference to the, the the first one that hasn't been closed, and you get a record or a report back that says I have installed this image or you know this manifest. Well, the result of installing this manifest is both of those previous dangling commands can now be closed. It doesn't matter which one induced the the, the completion because both of them are satisfied. My, yeah, I'll... Uh, I am proposing, I'm just going to uh, summarize what Brendan's saying by saying, I would like the uh, teat messages to be item potent. Yes, be, I agree with that one. That statement, it should be item and, opponent, right? It, so and because of that, the token ID. shouldn't matter. Actually, I thought it was that because that is the matter, right? So, yeah. um, like first command to second one may become a uh, even if you install from client, it explain as a reinstall, right? First worked, second install is maybe reinstall or it is a new op or decline. So that actually has different interpretation. So I always feel that any time you do a, a the last update, well, well, application installation should have a unique transaction ID. So let me ask a question to Brendan, um, because the suit manifest defines the, what is it, the, the update procedure, if I'm using the right term, with capital U update, capital T, I think it's update procedure, okay? If you already have a particular suit manifest with a particular digest installed, and you initiate the update procedure a second time, <laughs> What would you expect the suit reports to contain? The suit reports should contain exactly the same content as if it were installed. Each of the checks will result in the same result. Each of the, um, you might get a different result code for a fetch. Like it might say, I've already got that rather than I got that okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not, so far, we have left that as an application or an implementation dependent mm -hmm. detail, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly wouldn't give you a failure. It might just give you a different yeah. result code. So the the result should be either identical or the parts that matter are identical. 
And if, if it is, uh, you know, if the fetch had a different result, wouldn't that be the same as if you'd pre-cached the binary and uh, with the, you know, in other words, the, the binary was pointed to by the manifest, but the binary wasn't in, bundled into the manifest. And if you already had the binary cached locally, isn't, wouldn't you get the same result in that case the first time? Yes. He's verifying. Okay. So yeah, that. Thank you for verifying my understanding. Um, so my belief then is that the token shouldn't matter. In other words, even if you were to reorder the two and respond um, with, uh, you know, if you were to res uh, flip the successes in the reverse direction and match them with the opposite ones, you'd end up with exactly the same result. Please the so, token yes. doesn't matter. Okay, I'm going to flip back to their slide, but this is just where I was pointing to where it is in the suit manifest. So, Dave, do you still want to comment on your questions from about 20 minutes ago? Because I think I forgot most of my answers already now. Uh, any comments that you still have? Yes, you're next in queue. Go ahead. Anything you still remember, please. Yeah. I, there's so much I would like to comment on. I, I should have made notes. So uh, <laughs> the, 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 the delay was a little bit vast, I have to uh, highlight. Um, so uh, first of all, there was this uh, sequencing question. Uh, could you go back to uh, one of the uh, interactions, like option three, for example? Uh, this resolves an interaction between TMA A and TMB, B, leaves everything to agent, uh, I, I still think there might, uh, if, if, you, if you're going with evidence and such, there might still be a relationship between A and B because I am not entirely, because TEM B now has to understand what is depending on it when there is a request coming, that when this is this uh, thing initiated from agent that is not highlighted here, I think. Um, and then uh, uh, TEM B has to request evidence now and it doesn't know why. Um, it doesn't know that Tem A has some done something uh, and, uh, and provided probably also uh, attestation requests. Uh, Tem B probably could be another entity entirely. No idea what Tem A uh, actually created uh, evidence received for A. And even if Tem B would receive it, it could probably I might not have a, had to discover a, a, a verifier to check that evidence because it's again a separate entity somewhere else. So uh, it is surprised by this. Uh, maybe and uh, and why why the uh, uh, concatenated thing from uh, option one or two uh, is is somehow uh, uh, mitigating that problem because Tem A could now uh, provide that information to Tem B. Um, it is actually uh, more fragile because agent I think is a chaining and therefore if Tem A Tem B stuff fails, how does agent uh, the agent know about this? Uh, that is like uh, tab A has to inform agent like my dependency failed. That is more complicated, more complex. So in this uh, option three and four are better, I think. But now the uh, the burden of appraisal is somehow weird for Tem B. It doesn't know, I think, what to do here sometimes. Right. Uh I done second respond, but I want to make sure you can finish before you forget what else you're going to say. So I, no, I can no, no, that's that. that, that's that's okay. the most important gotcha. thing. The other three okay. are gone, I think. Okay, gotcha. So let me respond to that. So let, before I get into B for a second, let's talk about Tem A. Okay, when uh, so the the way that this works is query request would include uh, the challenge. So if you're using nonces, right, then this is where the nonce would appear, and yes, the e well. would appear in query in query response. Yeah, can it Sorry, I was getting background noise. Was that somebody interrupting? I think somebody uh, they muted. Okay, okay. So I'm just I'm going to say what A is, and then I'm going to say how it's the same for B. So in A, um, the same message that carries the evidence also carries the fact that it need that it's asking for A, but what it does not pass the TAM A in the current protocol is it does not identify which untrusted app is expressing a dependency on A. OK, it, it, it's not something that would normally be in the evidence unless we start specifying it in rats. And it's not something that's in the TEAP message. So what that means is TAM A is making a decision purely based on the fact that the agent says that it has a need for A and the TAM can decide whether to grant that request or not, regardless of who's depending on it. OK, so now let's go to TAM B. Same answer. TAM B, it could have been that this you that the untrusted app had a dependency on B, right? 
if that was the case, Tim B wouldn't know which untrusted app, at least in t today, and therefore it does not need to know, at least that's the current claim, which T the fact that it's A, you know, TAA that depends on B, because it didn't know that an untrusted app would. That's not part of the requirements right now. And so here what happens is that the reaches out to TAM B and TAM B doesn't know why yet, so it sends a query request. What's your state and why are you asking me? Okay. In the response, the agent attests with his evidence and says, and I'm, I'm talking to you because I need B apparently. Okay. And then TAM B can decide whether to grant that wish or not. So the point is that TAM B is doing the same thing as TAM A, where the thing that you're worried about is not currently a requirement in the protocol. You don't care what the dependent what the dependent uh, uh, piece is. Okay. okay, that is what's confusing to me because the slide literally starts with dependencies and a dependency chain, and then the solution has yeah. nothing to do with dependencies at all. So that well, is something that is has to go through. <laughs> yeah, the title is showing what the suit manifests look like, right? And so in this, if we were having this ah. discussion, the suit working group, right? If we said, if you have a reference from one suit manifest to another suit manifest, right, where A depends on B, there's nothing in the manifest for B that identifies A on the other way around. Okay, okay. In this case, all the decisions why something is not working in this option three or four even is better because, uh, yeah, the agent has total control of about completeness. Um, it might be interesting to, to have this uh, aliveness feature. Uh, I have no strong opinions about it unless it's, if it doesn't scale well, if you do that a lot. Right, right, right. My, I have two goals that I'm attempting to optimize simultaneously and maybe at odds sometimes, but I'm hoping not. One is that I would like the agent to be able to scale down to a constrained device. And number two, I would like an ultra scalable TAM that ideally has zero state or as close to zero state as at you mean uh, zero state between HTTP requests as possible. Mm. Now that might not be possible, but how close to zero can you get? And then you can make your TAM be ultra scalable. Okay. So I, I have some comments. I guess I should join the queue. <laughs> I, I can't see the queue. So unless Nancy's managing it, I just speak. So no, I mean, remember nobody's helping take notes and yeah. just realize. We, we have a we have a small enough participant list that I'm fine just jumping in unless Nancy yeah, wants to start. Yeah, I mean, you, you guys should just jump in. I'm, I'm not. This is a side meeting. <laughs> yeah. So, jump in, so Brennan. Go, go away. Okay. Go, go. Yeah. So, if we go no, back not, to option not two away. for a moment. No, no, not go away. <laughs> go, go, go Brendan. Two for a moment. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, option two is an interesting one. Uh, I think we could make it work. If if you if this is what you want, if this is desirable, then the only thing I see here that's even remotely problematic is that TAM A might lie and provide an old version of B that it fetched at some previous time. But that sounds like that's something that's very easy to overcome. Yeah, that's not the only problem. That is one problem. I I, I believe but, that this one would be solvable if we wanted to go here. It's just a bunch of work. So the no, bigger I don't think it is a bunch of work. Is, the bigger question to me is if Tam, B's, work. if Tam B's policy is that I will only give out the B suit manifest to somebody who attests to me that I trust that they're running inside the right TEE. Okay. Right. So so you can you can deal with that by forwarding the evidence on from the agent. If TAM A forwards the evidence from the agent uh, on to TAM B. It's not that easy, no. The evidence itself, if you inside the RATS architecture, you have to ensure that that evidence is fresh. Okay. So the notion of the challenge is to say, if you're using nonces, which is the way that EATS were first defined, it might not be the only option, but, but nonces is like the thing that we usually talk about then the evidence has to sign the nonce provided by the thing that wants to receive the evidence. And so that means you can't just forward on the evidence used for A, because that would use A's nonce, and you need the one signed with B's nonce. Okay. There's probably a way around that. In fact, <laughs> I'm convinced yeah. there's a fairly clean way around that, but it starts invoking trusted time stamp servers. Um, uh, there are three options in the RATS architecture. One is nonces. Okay. 
which requires an extra round trip to go and fetch the nonce. But hey, you know, the Teak protocol has this yeah. query yeah. request step that kind of has that extra thing, which I would like yeah. to get rid of in cases where you don't need it. The second option is synchronized clocks. And so that one requires timestamps, but it requires that you have a clock and that that's actually synchronized with a trusted time source. So that's the hurdle there. And the third one is something that is using handles um, that requires both of them have the same epic number that they get the same epic uh, thing from some trusted handle distribution server. Okay, That one is actually doable and, and uh, can potentially be used to solve this as long as all of them have the same handle distributor. I saw Hank nod once, and so I don't know if he has any comments on that. But I agree with you, Brendan. This one is solvable. It's just work to solve it. Um, I don't know if there's sufficient reason to do the work to solve it. Or if we should just say, we're going to specify option three. Fair enough. Yeah, I can add to this that this uh, both solutions, synchronization of clocks or distribution of handles, requires extra effort. It's as easy as that. Um, and so uh, uh, there might be scenarios where this is unavoidable, but then architectural wise, it's also doable. The, the evidence conveyed can change. Uh, appraisal of evidence is not defined here. So, so you can add that on, but without it, you cannot do this fair uh, uh, relaying of evidence uh, by still claiming it's fresh. So you do have one more option, and that so is the trusted timestamp server, right? The, the trusted timestamp server puts an additional. Um, piece of effort in that the agent has to get its uh, its evidence time stamped, the rest of it falls away, the rest of it's fine. That, that is a handle distribution thingy, like you can, you can, you, it's, a, it's a hybrid of handle and clock. You can, of course, with every uh, request for evidence, you can add the fly, uh, uh, keep a uh, fresh uh, timestamp uh, from a timestamp server, that, that's how Tudor works effectively, uh, the time-based unidirectional attestation. And then you can relay evidence as long as you will and, uh, for the feasibility of the timestamp token. And so that, that's fine, of course, also. But it's, again, it's, it's, it's introducing the idea that both TAMs have to have access to the same timestamp server provider, which is a handle provider in the architecture, actually. Yep. Um, Ning, you were trying but to say are, something. Yeah, I would like to add a comment. I just say uh, this model was option three in general, uh, favor, option three for a reason. Uh, think about the chaining dependency, right? If the A dependent B, B dependent C, so if it's option two, will B collect C and hand it back to A? Because I don't want to scale. If a later device, the agent handle that, right? It handle dependency, it go to A, go to B, go to C. Depends on that if you have chain of dependency, it can go further. Oh, yeah, so this great model, point. I had thought about that. Manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. I think chain will fail. Yeah. I don't see why. I think any of these options will allow for that chaining. It's just you're just nesting differently. No, I agree. And, and in fact, B2... oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I actually yeah, agree key... with, with that point. Um, and, and in fact, the thing that I would bring out is that when, especially when we start invoking things like a uh, constrained device, getting uh, one of the TAMs to do all of the work for the constrained device and thus cutting down the number of round trips it has to do, cutting down the bandwidth that it consumes, cutting down all of that, even the number of secure sessions it needs to establish, those all save resources, those all cut down what the device actually has to do, and that gets you closer to being scalable, not further. Um, okay, so I think I Ming's point is that if you have a tree of stuff, you know, A depends on B, depends on C, A depends on D, if they involve different TAMs, that means you have to go out and collect all of the nonces and stuff, send them down to the agent, so you now have a whole bunch of nonces you need to include either in your evidence or evidence sets somehow to be able to pass back. That's the complexity. Is it solvable? Yes, if we wanted to do the work, but I don't know that it's important work to do, so. No, indeed, and, and that's where the question of unidirectional attestation probably makes more sense. That's Yep. I will add uh, another comment, so if I may, um, say, for constraint <laughs> devices, right, we may not have this kind of uh, 
uh, complexity that a manifestation to OPA maybe, right? So constraint devices that the application may not be that too heavy, I would say. Number session need to go out. Uh, hopefully that uh, is not a comma. So that's okay, so option, option, right, so you're good option hmm. two is the one that Hadas originally put into the issue that he filed. So I think this is what he was thinking when he filed the issue before we had the discussion. And so since he's not on here, I'm just saying. Oh, he was. Uh, ha oh, he's on your own. He is, oh, he is welcome. very descriptively okay. named web authorization protocol. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah he's, uh, okay, so he's I would a, like to hear from Hadas right? since you opened this issue. Do you need me to go back through these or do you have opinions on them now? Hannes, you may be on mute. Nope. He could be. No microphone. No, yeah, it's probably locally muted, but this WebEx is on. Oh, yeah. Hey. Let's say, uh, uh, I will put it in the chat here. I, I'm doing so it. He can cue us. Oh, okay, yeah, let you do it. So. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Russ ask web boss, like, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> well, just like I'm I'm the rats working group keeps the web, web <laughs> The entire working group, yes. Yes. Yeah. We are the entire <laughs> <We're coming back. laughs> Very loud. Okay. Okay. So I do have one more slide that's a different example, uh, but I don't know if but which we can go back and forth between these, but uh, if Hannes, you have any comments before I add in the, the last piece of the question. Did anybody else have something they did not get to say yet on options one, two, three, and four before I add in the other piece, meaning same question, different example? Um, yeah, I do. Yes. So um, from from the what I learned from the hackathon, option one and two difference between one and two and three or four is how much the tip message format gets simpler or not, and making the TAM as much as possible as a stateless for then the tip message format gets simpler and simpler. So. Yeah, wait for the last one too, because oh, you're, that, that, that your your point is actually a nice segue to the other problem. Oh, okay. Because when, I, during the hackathon, I was trying to implement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Akira, um, you're saying the messages get simpler as you go from option one to option four. Um, no, be between one and two. Yeah. And between three and four. Oh, got it. So three and four is the it gets simpler. Yes. So I'd like to show the other example then, unless Hannes can speak, um, because you'll see uh, there's another dimension that uh, makes things complicated as well. So here's the other case. Okay, remember this case was I have a UA that depends on TA that A that depends on B. Okay, different case starting from the UA. In this case. I have an untrusted app that's going to be updated. So it's already installed and previously had a dependency on TA1. Okay, sorry, I'm, I was using A and B. Now I'm using 1 and 2. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so untrusted app dependent on TA1. New version of TA, uh, sorry, of the untrusted app comes down. This one now depends on TA2 instead. Okay. So maybe I switched out a crypto library and I'm now using a, a, a different uh, TA implementation of that crypto library or something like that. Okay, so I want to remove the dependency on the old TA and add a dependency on the other one. Okay, so that's what happens on the untrusted apps uh, updater. Okay, and now furthermore, assume that space is scarce such that I only have space to install TA2 after TA1 is removed. Okay, that's the example I want to walk you through. Okay. That if I tried to install TA1 first before removing TA2, I'd get sorry out of space. Okay. So what happens here? So if I walk through the flow, right, the query response gets and this, I'm going to use both of these, make it these simple and say there's only one TAM here. I could split it into two TAMs, but uh, I, let's combine it into one TAM just to keep this one a little bit simpler. So the query response says, hey, I need TA1 and my and I no longer need TA2. Okay, so the query response has both of those in there. And you say, what does the TAM do now? Okay, 
I says, because I wanted to try to implement this, and I scratched my head for a while saying, how do I implement this? What do I do in the TAM? Okay. Because what you need to be able to do in order for things to, to succeed, you need to first send a delete on TA1, and then when that, one, when that one finishes, then you can install TA2, right? If you do anything else, any other sequence, it won't succeed, okay? This is the, this is the golden path, right? You do the delete. When the success comes, you do the install. So how do you actually do that? So you can say, well, what I want then is I want the delete success response could trigger the install message. You're going to know what is it that triggers the install? Because normally, so far, we've only talked about an install being triggered by a query response. Okay. And so, how do I do that? Does that mean that? Uh, so, these are the different possibilities, right? It says, what do I trigger? The what it triggers this install message, right? Because the query response said I needed TA2, but I only sent a delete message. I couldn't send the install then. I had to wait for the delete to finish. So, what triggers the install is the question. Okay. Now, think about what happens. If the uh, okay, so what happens if the success message is uh, is you know lost for some reason? It times out because uh, there was some uh, connectivity glitch or something, so it couldn't contact the TAM. And you know maybe something happens with another thread or whatever that there actually is another query response. Was there a race condition or what? How do we resolve that? What's the right way to specify the TAM behavior? So here's four options there. One thing we could do is to make the problem go away by combining install and delete into one message. And so instead of having to serialize these, just going back here, remember back here in option one, we can pass multiple suit manifests and install. So this is this install A plus B is the same as two separate messages. And for the delete and install, they're two separate messages. So we could have a message that does install A, delete, you know, install B, delete A in one message, right? So that's what option one is. And which would change the message structure to combine both of the fields in the install and the delete into one message to be an install or delete message. Okay, that would be option one. Okay, then you could do it in one round trip and not have to wait and keep state and remember. Oh, I need. I'm waiting around to install this TA two, and so I have to remember that he's asked for TA two and so on. So that would be option one. Option two is to say, well, I never have to remember anything. I only trigger the install of the delete in response to a query response, right? And so then the query response comes in, I see a delete and an install request, and sorry, I ignore the install, I send a delete. Next time around, he has, to, uh, he has to connect to me, I generate a brand new query request, he sends a query response saying, I need to install TA2 still, and you say, great, now I can install TA2, okay? And so that one, I, the, the success doesn't trigger anything, I have to cause the agent to generate another query response in order to trigger the rest of the flow. That would be option two. Okay. Option three is to say the success and the query response get to be combined into one message. So my query response can say, and I now need TA2. And so we would combine the fields and success and query response into one message, similar to option number one. So this and there's still two round trips. So the analogy here is uh, delete A. Uh, sorry, uh, let's see here. Delete a success and query response. Sorry, uh, and uh, install the other one in success. Right, I, I didn't draw the picture here. Option number four is to allow the or the install and the delete to be triggered either by reception of a success or reception of a query response. But this one has a bunch of extra complexity because the success is giving you the deltas on the state. Like, I just finished installing one thing, but I'm not retelling you what I still need or what I don't need. And the query response is the full state. And so now I have to deal with being able to parse both deltas and full state and deal with that in my state machine. And so this one, in my opinion, is the most complex. Um, out of these, my preference would be option number one, only because to uh, Brendan or whoever's point, this one reduces the bandwidth and constrained devices by getting things down into fewer round trips. That's option number one. It's the only one that has the, the that has not an extra round trip. All two, three, and four all have the extra round trip. And so option number one would be the most friendly for a constrained device in terms of uh, bandwidth and latency. Uh, Dave, this is Hannes. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Can. Go ahead. Um, like, I missed... Uh... Uh, the initial part of the discussion, but uh, leveling up to where we came from and, and what we discussed on uh, the GitHub issue, um, I think the difference between uh, your view and my view 
was you basically argued that the dam should do all the conflict resolution and then it just pushes things down. Um, no, no, opposite, the opposite. Uh, I'm arguing that only the agent does dependency resolution. That's option three, right? Option three is the one that is my proposal, that only the agent does resolution, the TAM never does dependency resolution in this example. Oh, okay. Then I completely misunderstood you because you, you said that as these additional messages which I had introduced like in, um, I think this continued or, or something uh, is not needed, but uh, I think then right. we are on the same page anyway uh, already on that. And, and the question is um, what you are looking at here is what's the best way to implement it then? Yeah, option number three, before you got on, I was explaining there's no continue here. There's only a continue in option number four, the continue or in progress or something. Option number three has no new messages and mm -hmm. all the dependency resolution is on the client, meaning the agent. And this is the one that is my preferred approach. The disadvantage on this one is that the TAM sends an install and it may be a long time before it gets the success message for A because the dependency resolution has to happen in the meantime. But my belief is this is the normal suit manifest processors dependency resolution thing that's consistent with the suit spec. But uh, for example, here in this exchange, uh, you the client in with the install, the client gets the DA and then suddenly figures out that, oh, it needs some personalization data uh, from a different from Dampy, let's say. Uh, and but it has no way to send that message to time B. It basically has to wait till it gets by magic. Uh, or is, no. there, or is okay. that the message that is not is kind of hidden here? Yeah, uh, I, sorry, I walked through this before you got on, so I'll briefly do the same thing. But this is showing us the TEEP messages. The HTB messages, if you remember, there's yeah. never a line going to the left without a line going to the right. That's a zero byte post. And so yeah. the query request is a response. And so what happens okay. here is in the suit manifest of A, it identifies the dependency, which in this case, it depends on suit manifest B, which is reachable via TAM B. And so what okay. happens is he has to open the zero byte post off the TAM B saying, I need to contact you. TAM B then responds to the T query request saying, why are you talking to me? And then he says, here's my here's my evidence, and I now need B, and the flow continues. And so the invisible one is that zero byte post. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, um, that makes sense. Okay, so this was uh, saying uh, my preference is for option number three, although the other ones could work with effort. Okay, but option number three, my belief is that this is the simplest. Um, but this is still a case which is only doing install, install. So the other variation is when you have a delete and install, whether they're two different TAMs or the same TAM. Mm -hmm. And in the case where they're the same TAM, this is why I argued that if you want the TAM to be as stateless as possible, then either option one or option three, where option one is the simplest one, is the one that allows the TAM to be the most scalable, as well as providing the fastest latency and bandwidth reduction in option number one. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this one does require a message format change because we take two messages and combine them into one message and take the different fields and say they're just optional. You can have installs and or deletes in the same message. But probably not a big drama. That's my belief. And so here, because I was trying to implement this during the hackathon, I was working on the delete behavior, right? And I came into this case here and my implementation saying, I don't know what to do if I if I get both of them. And so I didn't implement the case of what happens when I ask for both of them, because I kind of stopped here and said, file issue, and we'll discuss first before I go into implementation. Makes sense, yeah. And so because if they would have been combined in one message, I could just do it all in one pass. I don't have to keep any state, query response, generate stuff, send the install slash delete. Flush all state, I'm done, wait for the next time that he connects. And so option number one would be the simplest for the TAM. I yeah, the reason it's... I think why we had this install delete as separate messages was um, related to the earlier debate about uh, the security domains where creating a security domain was more, um, had these separate um, yep. sort of additional payloads. Uh, and now, if, and the delete didn't. Um, so I don't, uh, yeah. But now we move that into the suit manifest, and so right. that means the cheat protocol is simpler now. So right. Right. I, I think you're right. The original reason they were split does no longer applies. Yeah. 
So other implementers, Akira, Asobe-san, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? Would you be okay combining and installing to lead into a common message? Other implementers? Um, yeah, well, one of the three is, yes, it's the same as uh, TAM, is going, TAM is going to be a stateless or the agent going to keep the tracking. So uh, yes, one is fine. So to, three keeps it stateless, but has the extra round trip. Yes, One gets rid of the extra round trip. Yes. And for the tip message format, combining install and delete is, isn't that, isn't that, doesn't look. Yeah. The, uh, the response to both of them is identical. That's the success or error message. And so you're going to do the same kind of response to both messages anyway. And so. Uh, one of them has a list of suit manifest, and the other one has a list of uh, component IDs to delete. And so we just put uh, your installer delete message has a list of zero or more suit manifests and a list of zero or more component IDs to delete. Okay, I see Hannes process. prefers one and Asobe Sun prefers three. Um, so uh, Asobe Sun, can you, uh, can you say why you prefer three? Yes, agree with Hannes, uh, but I don't know the suit. I'm looking for uh, if there's a technical reason to prefer three. I'd like to hear it because I can't think of a technical reason that three is better than one. Because okay, otherwise, I'm going to generate a pull request that does option one on this screen and option three on uh, on this one. Uh, because that's my preferences here. But if somebody can give me technical reasons why something else is better, happy to listen. Um, I might have a comment on combination of content as our messages. Basically, basically you are uh, uh, co you're not actually combining the uh, operations; you are uh, concatenating them in a single message. So Correct. that could be a, a general structure, because it could, in theory, then pro uh, facilitate one or three both. I don't know. I'm just asking. Sorry. I was going to ask the same thing. I, I see them as being separate, and so you could do both. Um, what is the reason uh, for a single post request per command or per request? So Hannes highlighted uh, this. Uh, 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 I, I want to respond to Nancy, and then I didn't understand your question, Brandon. Uh, in, in option number one, this combines two messages that are going from the TAM to the agent. Option number three combines two messages from the agent to the TAM. There are actually two independent things, right? Doing one change is, doesn't do the other one. Correct. And that's why I was saying, I, I, I guess I wasn't seeing them as, as one or three. You could do both. Yeah. I, I don't know of a reason to do three is my question, but sorry. Uh, ah, we can that's go on to your question now. Yes. I'm just asking if a, there is a specific serialization reason or something else that has uh, induced the pattern of sending only a single um, TEEP message per request or response. When you say, uh, I'm trying to parse your words here and translate them into TEEP protocol terms. Do you mean only sending one response, query re one uh, TEEP response in response to a TEEP request, or are you asking about something at the HTTP layer? That's what I'm not understanding. Which question? I'm asking about the intersection of TEEP and HTTP. Is okay. there a reason to send only a single TEEP message, be it request or response, in any given HTTP message? Ah, thank you. I understand your question now. Um, no. The, the other than what the transport spec says right now, but there's no inherent principle behind that that says that that's a requirement. And if you remove either, right now, that. it is zero or one. And if you want it to be zero, one or more, that would be possible if there's a good reason for it. Yeah. If you made that change, then <laughs> you instantly get one and three.
I'm thinking about that. That's an interesting observation. Um, and I got a, I have a comment here. I mean, so um, I see this as a slow slope here where we combine. I understand optimization. Yeah, I gave it. I I want to see this one. Let's give a extended example here. I depend on application TA one, but now we're by TA two and TA three. Right? Again, I go to the plurals of uh, TS. So now we optimize it. Uh, by option one, you have insert delete one message. So it's a delete TA one, but install on TA two, not TA three. So where's the TA three will hang out, right? So which one pick? Uh, so that's Sorry, a random you, question makes can sense. Can Do we support a batch? Yeah. If yeah to, to, today, say, an install is a batch and yeah. a delete is a batch today. Right. So now they say, Right, I talk about a case here. So right, you install uh, delete TA one, but then you install TA two and TA three. The okay. option one approach, we merge into one message. What does that mean? That means the way delete TA one, you install both TA two and TA three in one message. Correct. As a batch, as a batch message. Co correct. Today you can install TA two and three in the same message, and you can delete TA one in a single message. Uh, or you can even delete five TAs in one message, and you can install five TAs in one message. But what you can't do is you can't uh, delete one or more and install one or more in the same message. And we're doing a mix of operations, which I said today. So one operation type by so, each message. Yeah, so what here, the, if we were to combine them, and I'm going to compare it with Brendan's suggestion, which I hadn't thought about before. Um, yeah. If you combine them into one message, then the behavior is you do all the deletes before the installs. Okay, you just process all the deletes, you process all the installs, then you're done with the message and you send back your your uh, your error or success with the suit reports. Um, if you split them into multiple messages, you could have done that. Uh, like, uh, let me go back to say this message here with install a comma b. If you took Brendan's approach, you wouldn't need to have done this. You could have done another variation that would be semantically the same, would be install A and install B as two different TEEP messages in the same HTTP response, right? That would be equivalent in Brendan's example. Yes. So I think the only difference is better Seaboard compression, but semantically it's identical. But I think, like I said, I think the only difference is, um, is just Seaboard compression. Um, I think the other possible difference that I don't, maybe there's an interesting thing there, I can't think of a case, is um, if you install A and B, if you're using tokens, which again, I'd like to get rid of, um, then you'd have to have a all the answers being the same success message, as opposed to if I said success for A and success for B, I could split those into two different messages sent at different times. If we get rid of the token and just use the suit digest, then that difference goes away and the only difference is this is the Seaboard compression. What you could do for the success is you uh, open up a Seaboard sequence of all the success responses and stream them until they're done, and then you end the restful connection. Yeah, but my example is what happens if success of A and success of B, there's a delay of, say, uh, you know, three minutes while you're doing work in between those two, right? Well, uh, on, a, on a restful I'm state or something? I don't want to have to have a hanging HTTP uh, connection that uh, oh. degrades the, the, the TAM scalability. Oh, you're thinking in HTTP. I was, I'm was. i thinking HTTP2 and co-app, and there that is not an issue. But if you're going with old school HTTP, that will become an issue, yes. Yep, yep, yep. I think for constrained yeah. devices, we, we have to presume conventional HTTP for now. Well. That argument goes both no. ways. Some people would argue that wow. uh, for constrained devices, you want to go co-app, but uh, that's a different mm. argument. It's outside of our working yeah. group right now. Actually, funny enough, uh, because we also discussed this uh, SIM cards use an HTTPS based provisioning protocol straight into the SIM card. So, and SIM okay. cards are not necessarily known for being high performance devices. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. I any other thoughts on this because otherwise I'm going to take some direction and and do pull requests for people to review uh, to see if you like my, my write-up of option one on this slide and option three back here. Uh, 
because I think that gives the most efficient answers in terms of both CPR compression, et cetera. So I thought, Brendan, you made me think to see, is there actually an advantage to do that? Because that's that's not a, your, your point is correct. Um, I don't know if it buys us anything given that you lose some CPR compression, but it's- Would you like a further spanner for your works? No, but I will accept yeah. one. Will I like it? I don't know. But go if ahead. You, What's the spanner? If you go down the road of sending multiple CBOR messages within a uh, a single HTTP request, uh -huh. and you just so happen to pack those in a single CBOR structure, and uh -huh. you look down the road to when packed CBOR is available, your packed CBOR argument goes out the window. Yeah. The, okay. I understand. Uh, I think in the past we said. Uh, we would have to do another version of the protocol if we ever wanted to switch to use PAC Seabor, and that might be never. Um, we don't know. So that was the IETF 108 discussion. Yeah, having seen this progress, it looks likely that this is a useful thing and will happen right now. Um, I'd also say that uh, for the uh, options here, uh, why uh, Brandon's uh, suggestion is a very interesting compromise for meeting in the middle here. Um, I would also like to hear an argument why uh, the mixing of uh, uh, installation operations and deletion operations, operation general is not allowed. So you could yeah. have a single TEEP message, not an HTTP concatenated decision of, of, of TEEP messages right, that right. could allow for all of these. And, and there might be a reason why you don't do that. And right. one of the reasons might be the, 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 the latency of the accumulated uh, batch operation here, uh, which I understand now. But, but, uh, but there is a reason why you haven't done this. And you're considering merging install and delete only on the message level and not on the tra transfer level. And that is, I think, an option that has to be at least spelled out at some point, I think. So right now, my preference, Brendan, so just thinking about the discussion we had at 108 that I just summarized, you can look in the minutes, but there was a discussion about, I think it was 108, right, where we talked about PAC CBOR, 107 or 108, I think it was 108, but um, some recent IETF uh, TEAP meeting. Um, my preference would be to say, great idea, what if we just punt that to say, at such point in time, if ever, as we take a dependency on PAC CBOR, then we do it at that same time and just go with option one of this slide as being the simplest one for now. Um, that would be my preference, but I am not, I don't feel strongly about it. So the argument I was making, to be clear, was that you put take a dependency on PAC CBOR, but you simply recognize no, that I if, if, PAC CBOR became available, then it would be a relatively low cost upgrade to cut the bandwidth costs. Yeah, I understand. Uh, uh, I guess partly my preference has to do with the uh, transport spec as currently uh, is currently specified. It has multiple uh, interoperable implementations right now. Um, and number one does not require any changes to that. And your idea would require changes to the transport spec and the implementations and get roughly the same behavior and maybe some additional advantages that you're pointing out. But I don't know if it's if the advantages are worth having to change the spec and the implementations if the spec has already completed working group last call. So, but it's a good question. Fair enough. I mean, maybe this is something that sits out and and sits there in the back as background as an option for the uh, the the next variant of the spec if one ever happens. That was exactly what I was trying to say when I said at such point in time as we depend on PAC CBOR or whatever else. So, you know, hold for document update type of uh, response. Yeah, but it's a you're making. I, I'll, I'll think about it some more. I see if I can think of any other things after this. But uh, thank you for raising the question. That's a great point. In the future discussion of the TIP protocol, um, we really need to dis, uh, defi um, um, concrete to de make a decision. Who's going to, who is the person going to take uh, responsible of uh, dependency re resolution? So the agent side or TAM side? And I think well, everything today's discussion is going on the agent side is going to take care of the dependency. And then, after yes. 
Brandon, do you want to summarize the suit discussion uh, and the suit manifest around uh, dependency resolution? Just certainly. Uh, give us a little set. In in the suit manifest, uh, the way the suit manifests work, uh, the only uh, entity that's actually trusted to do dependency resolution is the manifest processor. Uh, and that's just because anything else can uh, play nasty games if you have multiple trust domains involved. So if you uh, if you have to evaluate who is allowed to install um, a a component in slot in positions A, B, and C, then you need to make that determination actually on device. There's nowhere else that can trust it to do that. And and so the result of that is that dependency resolution can only be done on device because only the device can be trusted to determine whether uh, the the various signers of the various components actually had the right permissions to, to be able to do that. Um, so so that's th that's the effective result that that uh, when it comes to dependency resolution, the um, the manifest processor looks at what dependencies are required and fetches them as required. Nothing specified as to whether this needs to be depth first or breadth first, but it's probably a depth first search. So thank you. So that's so in other words, the suit working group, the manifest processor is on the agent side, just to put the true terms together. And we only have a uh, option for the option three and four. And well, uh, option yeah. one and two would be possible only with a bunch of extra spec yes, work, yes, and would be yes. harder to do with a suit with a normal suit model, right? So yes. So, so that's the well, interesting thing. That's, were... that's where okay. bundling comes in in the suit manifest. Um, there, there would be nothing to stop you from producing an additional manifest which bundles a bunch of things together, overrides a couple of locations, and as long as all the permissions work out, it's fine but it can go in one message. Okay. Um, I see uh, 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 son mentioned, so I'd ask uh, why uh, you prefer option number three on this slide instead of option number one. Uh, and the answer was each remove and install results are contained into a single report, which is better. And I'm asking if you can elaborate on in what sense it's better, right? I mentioned why I think number one is better in the metric of uh, round trips, for example. Um, but in what metric do you think option number three is better? If you can put that in chat or whatever. Because RTT, I don't follow because option number one has a one fewer round trip. Option number three has two round trips. And so option number three still has, I'm going to give the analogy here. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll use this one. Got to say um, delete success query response uh, install. Okay? And so there's two round trips where option number one combines these like this one. And so it's install or delete and success. So the equivalent is this one looks more like option one. This one looks more like option number three if I change the labels. And so round trip time would argue for option number one, I claim. So unless I'm missing something, so. Okay, I was just wondering if we wanna, okay, here we go. Single report shows the proof of transactional updating process is success. Um, a uh, error message or success message can include more than one suit report. Each you know, zero, you know, zero or more suit reports, right? Each suit report reports on the success or failure of a particular suit uh, manifest by digest. And so your response can report on any number of successes and any number of failures in the same uh, success or error response. Okay, oh, I see. Okay, maybe that answers your question. So single report does not mean single teat message. It can be zero or more shoot reports per teat message. Okay, 
unless you comment again, I'm going to assume that that answers your question. But if I'm missing something, please feel free to continue. All right. Um, what do people think? Should we go to a different issue for a change? You, you should. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I uh, only set up the WebEx for two hours. <laughs> yeah, that's so <laughs> 45 minutes left. <laughs> uh, I said we can either stop now or we can use 45 minutes productively if people are, because if you would have stayed for the whole rat session, then. Yeah, no, the, the, I, 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 I'm just being cynical because we've yeah. spent an hour and 15 okay. minutes on, on one issue. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Which is the, one, the ones that I picked for the slides were the bigger, hairier issues. Right at the end of the slides, that means comparatively everything else is uh, far more straightforward because I didn't call them out for slides, right? That was very intentional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, most, so, of the, most of the other issues is related to 40 and 43. It, yeah. Well, the directly ones, related, but for the message format relation, yes. Yeah. Um, so between yesterday and today, I tried to uh, open some pull requests based on things we talked about yesterday. Would people rather spend time seeing the proposed resolutions that we kind of agreed on, or would people want to spend time picking one of the issues that we haven't discussed yet and, and start getting into that? So I don't know. Uh, Akira, do you have a preference? Or what, what, what's, which thing to talk about next? Um. Uh, for everybody else, I'll mention the uh, nomenclature that we're using here. Ready to close means it's already in the published internet draft. Um, have proposed text means it's sitting in a pull request that's not yet merged. And fixed an editor's copy means it's merged in, Git, in the GitHub copy, the editor's copy, but not in the submitted drafts. And so those are the three labels. Mm. So anything that says fixed an editor's copy means we've already merged it. It was on that list of stuff that Akira showed in the group yesterday that says some things have been merged. Have proposed text means that we probably already talked about it, um, but there's a pull request with text that you may not have seen. Um, and blank ones are ones that haven't been discussed in meetings. So other than it was on probably on Akira's slide of hackathon issues. Which is why I'm asking Akira, is there something you think you'd like to talk about? You want to pick one? Other than that, because uh, I, I can pick one, I'm just, I, I, I picked the previous ones. And so if somebody else has a preference, you know, go ahead and pick one. Otherwise, I'm happy to just, run, to, to just uh, arbitrarily pick one, but uh, I, I'm looking at other implementers to see, is there something else that you consider blocking? Not, not really. So. All right, so um, how about we start at the top and kind of triage things and at least agree on maybe what the next step is who has the action item? Some of these might be easy. Some of these might be, uh, let's take it to the list or uh, whatever. So I guess I'll just start at the top if that's okay with people. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so who is uh, this one? Is that somebody on the call? I, I don't know, GitHub handle to uh, real name mapping. Uh, he's not in the call, but um, yeah, okay. he, he, he's right. working with us, yes. Okay, so I understand the issue. The, the question he's raising is today, what the draft says is that the suit manifest is embedded, let's see, where's his example, um, is embedded, uh, there's a two examples. Okay. Uh, is embedded directly with CBOR versus embedding it as a beaster that you didn't have to call another CBOR processor on. Okay. And so whoever filed this says, you know, he would prefer it if it was embedded as a beaster that you don't actually see the manifest, you just see this uh, blob here as opposed to today, where you paste it in to say a Seaboard decoder, and it actually decodes inside the manifest. 
at least inside the suit envelope, I should say, not the manifest, but the suit envelope. So since suit envelope is something that Brendan, you defined, um, do you have any preference or recommendation for how you expect people to use suit envelope? So the first thing is that suit envelope uh, is probably uh, pending the suit meeting going to uh, be used as a suit envelope tag. As in, we're going to define a a seaboard tag for suit envelopes. I, I think an important step here. Um, so, if you care that that's there, then maybe that's something that's relevant. Other than that, the the next thing you should probably know is that everything inside of the suit envelope is already B string wrapped. So that may or may not affect your opinion of this. Um, my take on it is that. It's easier to set the endpoint of your uh, suit parser to determine whether or not you've got an overflow of an individual object if you know where that object ends. So, is that an argument it's for it's, here? It's making a point that says the fields inside the envelope are already Beaster encoded here, right? You see, this is just a, a Beaster instead of the actual full, you know, CDDL and stuff. Are you saying that, that argues for doing Beaster encoding? Uh, that, it, what it's saying is that it's not a deep structure if you want to parse the manifest. Yeah. Um, so you, you don't lose a lot by parsing it. However, that being said, if you want to find endpoints safely, then you probably want to have the, uh, the, the, the end pointer, something that you can actually set. Um, what does I will that also point out is that you get a little bit more reusability and modularity of code if you uh, if you do structure things in that way. One of the arguments that I was given for wrapping cozy structures in B strings mm -hmm. uh, within the list of cozy structures that we've got was mm -hmm. that this was what the cozy libraries actually expected. They wanted a start pointer and an end pointer. And if you didn't have an end pointer, that was difficult to do. But I was wondering, Brendan, uh, like I didn't quite understood whether you suggested us to use the B string, yeah. B string based wrapper or rather the structure directly. That's um, what I didn't quite Beaster comes to the links and so you know right where the end pointer is in the in the example that the filer uh, wants us to change to. What we have now looks like this, and when you start the uh, object here, you don't have the pointer. You don't know what the actual size is, and so you start. You can you say, well, the size of this one is such and such, and the size of this one is such and such, but you can't just jump to the end. So, and that that's relevant for some uh, library implementations. So, like this is why I made the point about the cozy yeah. objects within um, within. <laughs> Suit uh, the one uh, it was Kuhn when Kuhn was looking at this he said that it was really hard to um, to to hand a cozy object to a cozy library if you didn't know what the end pointer for that cozy object was. Gotcha. All right. So you're saying your recommendation is to go ahead and accept the request and change it as uh, directed here so it looks like this. Yeah, it costs you a few bytes, but it makes your software more modular. Okay. Uh, uh, I am convinced by your argument. And it's hey. more e easier to make the examples. Yes, in the deep message. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, deep side meeting discussion. Yes. Let's do this. Okay. Just hoping, decreases uh, visibility of structure, so that is the that is the cost. The cost is the, is yeah. the decreased visibility. But uh, if you do it in a modular way, as Brenton says, it actually might provide you with a canonical way how to go through the layers here, and then it's not a problem at all. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go on 83. We've already talked about, meaning that was part of the slides. Um, 81 was part of the slides we've talked about. Um, this one came up in the hackathon and was already accepted. And so I'm going to skip over it. It may accepted by the implementers. And so it's not as interesting to talk about given that all the implementers already agreed, or at least the implementers that were at the hackathon agreed, I should say. Uh, basically what this one says is the text was ambiguous in terms of when you need to include the TC list. And the answer is you include it whenever the query request asks for it. Duh. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, um, so going on to this one. So Akira, do you want to summarize what this one is? Uh, I'm going to scan through it here for a second. Ah, okay. So, yes. so um, for me, it wasn't that difficult to understand. But for me, yeah. uh, for the re just reading the draft, the text, and the the person who never attending the ITF discussion, maybe maybe it got it gets confused. There's a two places for s signing, and who's going to take uh, who's going to be responsible for the signing? Um, Tip message itself and the suit ma uh, manifest. And my my take my understanding is the suit tip message itself is should be signed by Tam, and suit manifest is should be signed by TC, just TA signer or, or TA developer yeah. or T, TC signer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think but this I, one is just editorial. There's no technical thing to discuss. It could be that we point back to you know a particular section of the architecture document, or that we have a. Yes one sentence version of each or something to make it way more readable there's no technical yes. question here right? okay yes because just reading the tip message protocol draft it doesn't say yeah. why you need two uh, signers gotcha uh -huh. whereas the architecture all. document does yes okay um 78, We you started mentioning at the end of the uh, meeting yesterday, Akira, and that was the one that I asked you which uh, issue number covers it, and you said 78 right before the meeting ended. And so let's just show people what was in here. Um, this is the one that uh, you can see the token is in here, and at the end of the hackathon, we had this meeting about this little field in here. There's a this one was fouled because there was a bug in the spec. You can see here other integers like data item requested come after options. And then you notice right in here, there's an integer that's not up there that's before options. That's the contradiction in the spec that the TEEP error does not actually conform to this right here that Akira uh, discovered during the hackathon. So. Uh, so we said, well, how do we fix that? And so one thing we could do is say, this is correct, in which case all we do is we move the error code down. Um, and notice this is a uint versus this one is an int. And so uh, you can see at the end here, I think Akira, you have a comment here. Okay, this is kind of what we agreed during the hackathon uh, here as the proposal to say, uh, star u int instead of star int and the error code moves to the end yes so this is the proposal from akira and asobi son and myself and I, don't, I forget who else was there so okay then it, oh. for the parsing the tip message on, only expecting the mandatory is the first type in the type entry and the option option yeah. is always there Option could be empty, but it's it's still OX A zero or OX A something will be expected, yeah. and anything else is option. Then yeah. And you can see the idea was to change it to, and so if token is optional, which we kind of talked about uh, yesterday in the meeting, uh, then if token is there, then it would be inside uh, the options portion, not in the stuff at the end because it's optional. Mm. So there's already a pull request that I have that actually does that, although some of the token question is still open based on the suit meeting. Um, all right. Uh, just one minor nit, uh, as you provided labels that will not be encoded in any case because it's array, I would also create a label for the last member here that is now uh, asterisk u int. Let's go back to, uh, yeah, you're right. Er error code does have a label here. So yeah, and also for consistency. Uh, I mean, the other yeah. two also have. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that was a bug in the because you can see here. So let me just show where this came from because I I was not the author of this. I think um, I helped edit it, and so some errors may be due to me, some may be due to Hannah, some may be due to somebody else. But uh, it was we all know that there was some bugs in there before. But you can see the start in with no label right here, and then if we look in, I think it is the. 
you know, maybe it's not copied into here. I'm just looking to see if the query request is actually copied into this issue because it's in the query request I'm looking for. There it is. Here, you can see there's no uh, label on the data item requested here. No, but data item requested is a group name, I assume, and therefore uh, it would uh, maybe uh, be labeled in the group. Uh, I don't know what you mean by a group name. You have to educate me on that. This is it's, not it's a, just an integer. It's, a, it's just an oh, this is just. An, Oh, this just uh, then it's uh, okay. I don't. I, I can't see this because it's not labeled. So yeah, uh, yeah I, because the first three items have labels, I would just be consistent and have this fourth yeah. or all three. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't have it up here. It's the, yeah, that that is um, the production. I've lost the issue that I was in. The production for data item request was something like data item requested equals um, you know uh, uint within size four or something like that. Or size eight, something like that. It's defined as a uint with a maximum size. Yeah, again, just prefix it with, an, with some some human readable label, uh, and then uh, it would be consistent. Yeah. So then it uh, it does uh, insert another you know byte or something into the encoding, but it makes the stuff be more consistent. And so then no, it no, it is not biting into the encoding because labels are not conveyed over the wire. Therefore, human readers of the CDDL here type will not be encoded, token will not be encoded, and the to be labeled int of course label will not be encoded. Of course. Ah. Okay. I thought it was encoded, but so uh, if it's not, then, not, then you want learning. to have a. If if you're not if you want it to be encoded, make it a map. Yeah, and but then we don't want unique. That. We don't want ah, that. Yeah, sorry, you're you're right. Yeah. It's encoded if it's a curly braces. It's not encoded if it's square braces. Exactly, but it's for humans, and then you know what it is. You can, uh, uh, if you have a good label, you can remove gotcha. the comment, and it's self descriptive. Uh, okay, well, so it's not I for think humans, can... it's for standards people. Yeah. So I think <laughs> yes, there are uh, sorry, in I the was mixing right now. Up. <laughs> uh, that that tells me. So thank you for pointing that out. I think um, there's probably some cases in the currently submitted internet draft um, that define numeric values for some things that are on the left side inside of square brace things that can probably be deleted because they're never conveyed. So the actual numeric value wouldn't matter. So there's probably a couple yeah. of, of unused productions in there we can delete. Also, uh, you're using uh, the colon notation, which already types these as strings. So you can't uh, retype them by defining type. That would also be an error. Got it. Yeah. So that that there is there are errors in the CDDL you're pointing out. So it's only CDDL frosting. It's just some consistency stuff, and this would not validate if you define type again. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can open the actual uh, spec here because I almost certain there's bugs in the CDDL then. Yeah, I mean, I haven't I have to uh, look at it at a whole and make a review in any case at some point. So, but it's uh, it's not. I think it doesn't speak in favor of CDDL if uh, so far all the specifications need either you or Carson to fix them uh, uh, because CDDL is so complicated. Yeah. So this, uh, if your if your perception would be correct, uh, Hannes, I would agree with it. <laughs> So this oh, right here yeah. is the thing is the list of things that I'm saying probably a significant number of these can be deleted here. Uh, some I don't know what you some did. some because <laughs> okay, some of these are inside like this one right here can't be deleted right. Yeah. That's that's but, a type uh, name. The, the ones yes. with the colons like this. See component yeah. ID is here, and so down here somewhere there's component like this line right here can be deleted as an example. Yeah. No. So the, the ones no. with the sorry. And no, that can't be deleted. I don't. I didn't see what. All right, sorry, I'm going to scroll back up to show where it was. Map. In the, in the example. Give us a map. Uh, I'm looking for it here. Yeah. So uh, let me let me hang oh, explain right. to you. Uh, you right, now Anna. stop. Now, no, he's not right. Uh, let me explain this to you. Um, if you're using the colon notation, that's a specialization of the arrow notation. An arrow is prefixed by a type. A colon is prefixed by a string. It's a convenient function for people that come from JSON because they expect the label to be a string and they use a colon there. So if you're using a colon for a label, it's always a string. If, if, if you use an arrow notation, like with X list uh, above, then this is a type and you have to define the type somewhere. With a colon, it's already typed. This is a string. 
that repeatedly that's... tripped me up as well. I expected yeah. it just to be a, a, any arbitrary type that I put in there. It took me a while to get used to it. Shit, yeah, it's I get it. It's same, Brendan. Me, but it's not so complicated. You're, you're pointing it's not the, the, This is the not why you this... in the document. In the this one you can blame me, right? Because I, I was the one that inserted this type here, and so this is um, my misunderstanding. I had the same problem that Brennan you just mentioned here. Um, uh, and you're he, telling me that my intent was uh, uh, that I should have. It, my intent may be wrong, right? But my intent was to, that this should be, you know, an integer followed by the beaster, and I should have used an arrow if I actually wanted that. So I don't know if this means that it's an integer or if you said it was a type. I, I was assuming integer and then a beaster as back-to-back -back, uh, fields in the in the map. If you use the arrow, it becomes a type name. Now component ID is a type name, and you have to say type name rule, also the equal sign integer, and then you would uh, uh, define the type. Okay, and then gotcha. It's here. Gotcha. So the typo is that that colon should be an arrow in this case, and then this production is used. Yeah, yeah. Let's use arrow as much as possible. Yep, I agree. Just forget yeah. that colon exists and everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly what's in the CDDL. Yeah. It says use the arrow. Uh, uh, instead, you're, if you're coming from JSON, use the string short one. That's basically what okay, So this what right you here, you're saying this I can treat as being a human comment, right? Yes. This is a exactly. human comment. This is a human comment. And so that data yeah. item requested here is just missing the human comment in front of it. Exactly, that is what I was saying. And okay. for human comments, I personally, as a style, always use a colon notation because it's it's uh, it's uh, shorter and you don't have to define a type for never being used. It's just useless. So in arrays, I typically use the colon notation, and for maps, I use the arrow notation. Gotcha. Thank you for the Hank explanation. Um, <laughs> useful. Yeah, it's just explaining. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you were saying down here. In this, in this now I'm back in the issue, not in the, in the document, right? You're saying add the human comment on the left side here, you know, a, a label or something like that, because it doesn't affect anything anyway on the wire. So there's nothing that affects the bytes. It's just saying it's just a documentation um, uh, clarity issue. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Gosh, I learned something about Seaboard. This has been useful. Okay. It is very useful. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it is. I agree. Uh, because you need to have Hank in addition to RFC to actually get it right. <laughs> yep. I'm still insisting that uh, it's not a coincidence <laughs> that in all the groups I've been to, everyone always gets it wrong. That can't be a, uh, yeah, oh, this yeah. is not random. Seabor is like Kirsten's initials. And so the point is he is the spec, right? You have to go to him. This is a CDDL thing, not a Seabor thing, unfortunately. Hank, so, yeah, um, okay. clearly you did CDDL wrong because CDDL is not your initials. That, yeah, that's the right, that, that's the right, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Ouch. That is an inherited problem. CDDL meant Ouch. something entirely different back in the day, but we, it was a Seabor definition language for first, and it was something else. We didn't start this. Uh, we just took it over when it was abandoned. It's supposed to be HBDL. There you go, HBDL. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. I'm fine uh, with cuddle. All right, let's pick another one. A um, couple of these that are just saying, yeah, we should add examples into the spec. So this this is one of the two that's just saying we should use add examples into the spec. Um, this one we talked about in slides. This one we talked about in slides. Uh, this one we talked about during the meeting. Uh, it did, didn't have a slide other than a curious slide, but it was covered kind of in my token slides. Um, that one was covered in slides. That's the other one that says, let's add an example. Once we have an example of a suit manifest and an example of an eat, we should add those into this document that says, here's an example eat that would be usable in the deep context. Here's an example suit manifest that would be usable in a, in a deep context, just so we have examples. Uh, that's on the back burner until the suit manifest, well, until the, the rats claims for eat are there, because you won't see the example until there's something to actually put in there. The suit manifest we could start doing if we constructed a suit manifest for, say, you know, maybe a uh, trust zone or something that has uh, a place to install stuff into. We could do that now. It just hasn't it hasn't blocked implementers yet. Yet. Um, those are already in the latest spec. Um, not a big. Now we're getting down to things that might not be a big deal. Uh, I could go into fifty one. 
49. I, I so I'm putting 51 in the stack. That will be the one I go into. If I don't find something better. 49. We had a slide about, and uh, Lawrence referred to it in the rats meeting. Um, 44. Hannes, do you remember what? 40, do you want to cover 44? Um, yeah. So so when I was working on implementation, I um, I was wondering how to best. Uh, and this is uh, using um, utilize X509 certificates uh, in this whole thing. But uh, now, since we pushed a lot of um, content over to Suit, uh, I think this is more um, a topic for Suit because that the reference RFC is is uh, kind of at least at that time I need to reread. It's like kind of complicated, but um, I think this is now more a, a Suit topic rather than deep. Okay, so do you think we should close this thing and just bring it up in suit, or do you think that once I think it uh, should be closed? Okay, it, yeah. making sure there's nothing we need to do in the spec that's a reference to anything. So, but you're okay yeah. just closing it? Yeah. Okay. Looking for any other low hanging fruit here. 43 is what we just spent all that time discussing. Another one with examples. That one overlaps with the other one. Uh, there are two that are just optimizations, but are worth discussing at some point. So we could also cover one of those because optimization is should we punt it to later or should we go ahead and cover stuff now? Uh, 40 is interesting because this one. Um, before Hannes got on, I alluded to it in one of the slides that I just showed in the, the, the long discussion we had for 45 minutes. Um, and this has to do with uh, the token discussion as well. And so um, it's, it's there's no new discussion this one, but it might be worth just me pointing out what what 40 is tracking. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll do that just by referring to the slide here where I covered it. Um, it was here. I remember when I talked about this line here that says, is it possible to send something unsolicited if you don't have a token? And so up here, the question is, remember, if you have a zero byte post, query request comes down and you send a query response, okay? So the question in option in 40 is, is it possible to send a query response without having to have the extra round trip to get the query request? Okay, because this was possible in OTRP. Now, let me tie this back to the discussion of the challenge needed in the evidence. If you're going to send evidence, you need to make sure that that evidence is fresh. There are three ways in the RATS architecture to make sure that it's fresh. Nonces, which need a challenge. Timestamps, which do not need a challenge. And handles, which do not need a challenge. So if you need a nonce, you have to do the extra round trip, right? That's the actual get get the nonce. The only case that uh, that issue number forty is interesting is in the case where we're using timestamps or handles. Okay, and so that's the scope of what issue five uh, forty is. Is if you're using uh, timestamps or handles, then there's nothing that. Then the question is, can you just jump and send the query response without having the extra round trip? That's what issue forty is tracking. In other words. If you were to delete the token in here, because the only thing that you have to that you need it for right now is to get the token out of the request. And if you delete the token, then you don't need it. Um, in the case where you're using handles or timestamps. Any comments on that? Now that you understand, hopefully, what issue 40 is tracking. Looks good to me. Uh, so then, we have any time left, or are we at the end here? I'm just checking the time. Oh, we still got 15, yeah, 15 minutes. minutes left. Okay, let's go back to 51. Since um, uh, since we've never talked about this one before, and only I think comments are from Hannes and me in here. So, currently, if we look in the Teak protocol spec, there's the error code space, right? And so, if you hit a failure processing something whether it's a TEEP manifest or just parsing the TEEP message, okay, there's an error code space. Now, in recent pull requests, we've made the change that says anything that would belong in a suit report 
no longer has a TEEP error code, right? There's just a TEEP error code that says suit manifest processor failed, see, see, report, see the suit report for details. Uh, but there's things that are TEEP failures that have error codes. And so that's what's defined, and it defines this. Uh, I, currently, it has an IANA consideration section that says we propose an IANA registry for the TEEP error codes. Um, and the uh, and it says that the IANA registry for those error codes is listed as expert review, right? That's what the spec says right now. It doesn't actually say why there's, you want expert review or why you have things. So I'm raising this as a question, okay? Do we actually want to have vendors that extend error codes and put custom error codes into there? Um, or do we just say, here's the set of error codes, right? By a perhaps poor analogy, right? Just to take an arbitrary other numbering space, right? HTTP has error code spaces and those ones are extensible, but that one says IETF review, okay? And uh, it's an interesting analogy just because both of them the error code is not the only thing that you can pass, right? If you, even if you use a standard error code, I can pass a custom thing in the text string along with it. You can do that in HTTP, you can do that in the TEEP protocol too. So you can already, already extend stuff by putting stuff in the text string. So the question is, what policy should we have on adding new error codes? Is it like RFC required? In which case, maybe you don't need an IANA registry, you just rev the RFC. Is it expert review? Is it IETF review or something else, okay? And so uh, the question here is, it would be simpler if we didn't have to have IANA involved, um, or if we did, then maybe IETF review instead of expert review, because you don't need a designated expert. But uh, since we've never actually talked about this, that's why this issue is here in case people have views on what direction we should take as far as error code extensibility. I think we should um, sort of, make it as simple as possible for people to add uh, new stuff and so i i'm more in favor of expert review like in general not mm -hmm. just for this one uh because writing new rfc just to add an error code um to me is overly complicated and most people like it's not that we need to prevent uh, random people on the street to register error codes for deep uh mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't feel strongly about this one, so I, I'm fine going along if that's what everybody thinks. I, I, I'm not going to argue against it, but it seemed like extra complexity without the rationale, so I just wanted us to talk through what the rationale is. Do you think that people will actually extend the error code space? Well, hey. uh, among the implementers right now, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I think they would, uh, but uh, but it's uh, a ray out occurrence, right? Nancy, were you saying something? My audio is cutting out, so I, I can barely hear you guys. Did you have an opinion on this, Nancy? Well, I... Um, there is a notion of having some extensibility from, from the error codes perspective, right? I don't know if we need a full IANA registry. So the question I is, guess... can we leave it extensible, but not have to go? Well, so the question that I would ask, given that you have the text field, is numeric error codes are interesting in addition to the text codes, if and only if, I claim, feel free to argue otherwise, um, I claim if you have code, that would pay attention to specific error codes and do something different, right? If it's just for human logging, you're going to use the text string for that, okay? And so if somebody need, if a vendor or an implementation or you know a future standard wants to add a new error code, the question is, what would the behavioral change be if it saw that error code? If the TAM saw that error code coming back, what would the TAM do differently? If you can answer that question, then you need a new error code. If you, can, if you say, I would just log it differently for human statistic gathering, then I would claim that the, that the text message is already sufficient.
So my question to Hannes and other implementers is, do you think you would extend the have a need to extend the error code space in a way that the TAM would need to treat it differently, uh, to have different behavior based on seeing that error code in an error message? When I followed this, I couldn't think of anything that the TAM would do differently. If it's an error, it's an error. But uh, I, I, I mean, there might be a couple of categories of errors that are already in the spec, but I couldn't think of new categories. So that's why I followed the issue is to, to ask this in, in an actual meeting. For me, but just the vendor adding any message they would like and the T-string should be fine. Meaning all you would use it for is uh, logging in human diagnostics and stuff, not yes. for, you know, case statements in the tab. No, no. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, I am all, I, I'm happy to have an IANA registry and expert review. If we think that your TAM is gonna have a case statement, you know, a switch statement with new cases that are gonna be added for specific values and it's gonna do something different behaviorally. Um, but I've not heard that argument yet. That's why I'm asking. So I don't know if Hannes, you have any examples or at least hypotheticals you can come up with? I would have to, I have to try, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question, yeah. Good that you okay, well, yeah. Feel free to think about it. You don't have to answer right now, but I won't consider this one closed until we can either ha agree on what the answer is. And if the answer is, yeah, we come up with an answer and then it's fine as the, do as the document has it. But if we can't come up with an answer, then asking IANA to des have a designated expert and having IANA review the stuff, it's just more overhead that I don't know if it's actually necessary, so. All right. That's what 51 is. Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question, yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to look for anything else, because uh, otherwise, I think that the other one's just examples, a request for examples. Anything else here? Nope, those are both ready to close. So I think we're at the bottom. So everything else is just open pull requests ready to be re reviewed. I guess by uh, the... Without going through these, just uh, going to repeat question to, I think, Nancy, do you have admin on this repo? I don't know if Nancy can hear me. Um, right now, whenever I file one of these issues, or whenever I file open a pull request here, I add all of the uh, TEAP protocol spec authors other than myself, except for I can't add Akira because I have to keep doing, um, you know, at Akira, please review and comment because the, it's he's not showing up as a contributor. So I need one of the admins to fix that. So, all right. Well, I propose that we end here. Hey, Dave, I'll fix that. Okay. Thank you, Chiro. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the fact that you were on. Yeah. Thanks, Chiro. Uh, and then I guess my last question to Tiru, which I could follow up over email, but since you're on now. Um, for the architecture document, we were following a process since there was lots of uh, vigorous working group discussion as the architecture that uh, only the chairs were closing issues. Um, do we need anything that drastic here or can we just say the um, authors are welcome to close issues up until we start working group last call? Do you have a preference here? Uh, I think it works for me. Anyway, I've been following with the updates to the architecture document and I've been closing um, the issues that have been addressed. So uh, I just thought two or three uh, new issues that needs to be addressed, not many are left. Okay. Up, so so it, if you don't mind closing the issues, then we'll just mark them ready to close. If you want to keep doing that for the protocol spec, that's fine. I just, I, I'm happy to do whichever process the chairs want. So. Sure. Okay. All right. Great. That's everything that I think is useful to go through on this call here. So. Um, Unless Nancy has anything else, I'm going to stop sharing. RT room. I'm good. Okay. Sounds like we can uh, end here. Thanks all for sticking around. Bye, sure. Everyone. All right. Goodbye. Good night. Whatever time zone you're in. Good morning. Whatever. Yeah.
I like the food. It's noon. Yeah. It's, it's 3 a.m. Yeah, it's 3 a.m. here. Oh. Time for you. you look pretty fresh at 3 a.m. Uh, oh, it's a good thing I have a low res camera. You can see I don't look fresh at all. <laughs> it's 8 p.m. here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's good, good, good afternoon. Good evening. 